All right, folks. Uh, while you're happily enjoying your meal, uh, we'd like to continue our program, and I think this is going to be really interesting. So I want to introduce a couple of the folks who are on stage here and then let them take it away. Rick Salgado is the Director of Information and Security and Law Enforcement Matters at Google. And man, that is a big job. And you know, they know security and they know threats. And Jennifer Daskal is the faculty director of the Tech Law and Security program at American University. They love wonks there, right? In Washington, DC, she's gonna moderate the discussion. They're both experts in cyber. They both have a background that brought them through the Department of Justice at one point. They both have seen this issue from many different directions. So, Jen, why don't you get us started on this and just uh, to enjoy while you're having your lunch. Great, well. Is this on? Can you hear me? Okay, great. Well, thank you. Thank you all for coming and thank you um, for Third Wave for putting this on, for NYU for hosting, for the Journal of National Security and Law and Policy at Georgetown for this fantastic conference. So we're just gonna, we're gonna spend the next 30 minutes having a discussion um, and um, I'm gonna ask Rick a bunch of questions so I have the easy part of the job. Um, we're, gonna, we're gonna talk through um, some of the questions, some of the issues about threat identification, how that's handled, um, some of the challenges with dealing with law enforcement and a range of other related issues that um, hopefully will be of interest to all of you. So, um, Rick, thanks for, thanks for joining us. And um, I'll start by, by asking you about the, the threat reporting process. So you see something in your system, what do you do with it, how do you handle it? Yeah, so nice to be here with everybody and I hope you enjoy your lunch, it looks quite delicious. I hope you've left some for us after this is over. But it's, yeah, so we, we see threats on our system, right? We've got platforms where people can post comments and uh, other types of media for others to see. Uh, lots of it is just entirely public, and so there are there are most certainly threats and uh, and other sort of comments that we think might be indicative of of real trouble. Uh, you might see a comment on a YouTube video, for example, of somebody uh, saying, "Life has gotten too hard. I'm going to kill myself," or uh, something about a school shooting threatening. Sometimes they're vague. Sometimes they're quite explicit. Uh, and when we see these things, when we become aware of them, and there's lots of ways we can become aware of them, uh, we're going to look at those, assess the credibility of it, and if it looks credible, uh, we're going to get that in the hands of law enforcement, and we're going to do that very quickly. Uh, we actually have a team of people who work 24-7 to get these things reported. Uh, so that you know, if there's actually a chance to prevent something uh, or to, to stop somebody from taking their life uh, or committing some atrocity, we're, we will not want to lose that opportunity. So we have a, we're very active in reporting these things to law enforcement so they can take action on them. And who do you say law enforcement? Who do you, what's, what's the reporting stream like and how does that work? You know, that, that really, it, this sounds simple enough, right? It's like, well, of course you do that. And, but it, when you think about it, it's actually kind of tricky to do this, uh, especially when you're a platform that has a global audience. You might see a, a comment that comes up and then look at it and say, well, this one seems to resolve, we think, to Warsaw. Maybe that's based on language and, and the IP address. There may be some signals we can look at. And then you got to think, well, how do we get this in the hands of authorities in Warsaw to deal with, assuming this is accurate data? Um, in the old days, uh, which really means if just a few years ago, what we would really do is start cold calling. We would we would call police agencies and say, hi, this is Google, and we wanted to, you know, oh, who is this really, right? Uh, and they wouldn't believe us, who we were. So it was actually a bit of a challenge to, to find a way to report these things. Uh, and it, it meant that even really trying to do the right thing and doing it 
with good resources and very promptly, still there was a high chance, or at least a, an, an unfortunately high chance of failure of actually getting it in the hands of law enforcement. So we've, uh, we worked with, um, with some folks within the FBI, uh, worked with other companies who have similar situation that, that we're in, uh, and there's, there's a, there are more than a handful of those, to try to find a way to, how do you actually do this so that you can get these threats in the hands of the police officer who can go and knock on the door and, and really understand what the situation is. Uh, we landed on uh, an organization in California called the Northern California Regional Intelligence Center. NICRIC is its acronym. Uh, and they have stood up uh, within their group a team of people who will take the reports that Google and some other companies make to them about threats, and they act as the clearinghouse. They don't actually have agents that go do any of these things, but they act as the clearinghouse for uh, sending out the threats. Maybe it's, maybe it's going to be to a sheriff's department somewhere in the United States. Maybe it's going to be something that's outside of the United States, and they're going to work with Interpol typically, and let Interpol serve as kind of the clearinghouse for international or non-U.S. cases, and they will handle it. So we've been doing that for a few years now, uh, a couple years now, and it has proven to be very effective. That's great. Now, when we talk about threats, that, that can mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people. So how, how do you go about, what is your definition of, of the kinds of threats that you'll, actually, you'll take action on and, and report? Well, I, with, the, with the flow that we're talking about now, these are, these are the indications that somebody's life is at risk or there could be serious physical bodily injury, that kind of thing is what we're really looking for, where we need to move quickly if somebody's going to get hurt. Um, it's not always easy. I, there's, it's not always clear. You can read something and it's ambiguous and, and you're not sure. Is this just somebody commenting and they're kind of, it's just more gamesmanship that they're writing this stuff out and they don't mean it? Is it, is it a term, do they, when they say shoot, do they mean they're going to shoot a gun or they're going to shoot a picture? Or it's very, it can be kind of ambiguous for us. Uh, but we do our best to figure out, does this look credible? If it looks credible, we're going to make the call. It's, I think it's tempting, it was for me anyway, tempting to say, well, let's just report everything. Let, like, let's not be in the middle of making the judgment call uh, and risk being wrong. So let's just, in, in the abundance of caution, get it into the hands of law enforcement. The problem is there's too many uh, bad, meaning like non-credible threats to do that, we would, we would start to inundate law enforcement with these. Uh, and I would also say we would start losing credibility. Right now, when we report something, people listen to it because we've gone through the assessment that this looks credible to us and we don't have a high false positive rate on these things. So it's a little risky to do that, but in the long run, uh, our evaluation is it's the right way to do it because uh, we will not, basically crying wolf too many times. Uh, so you know, we, we are the folks who do this work day to day uh, and night to night since it's a 24 operation, they learn from law enforcement, they learn from others who can educate them on how to judge credibility. There's often not a lot of context, you know, if it's just an isolated sentence fragment on a YouTube video, not a lot to go on there. Uh, so we have to do our best, but we don't want to ignore those. Uh, and so, you know, with, with what information and knowledge we have from our systems and the training we get from others, uh, we make the best call we can. And you started to talk about this a little bit, but how are you identifying the threats that are coming through? Are there systems in place to monitor, to look for certain tags? Are, there, are you getting reporting from outside? What's, what's the kind of the... Really speed? everything. We're, I, you know, one of, the, one of the things I talk about is, at Google anyway, when it comes to leads, for whether it's, regardless of the type of threat, we are hungry for them, wherever they can come from, and that includes certainly in the threat environment. So we have, and you can imagine if you were, you kind of put yourself in the position of somebody who's running a, a platform where there's user-generated content, you're going to want to have teams of folks who are looking at the behavior of the users, 
uh, for abuse and trying to detect it. You may take action on accounts in various different ways. In the course of that, you may actually detect, not only was there some kind of abuse that violated the community guidelines of the terms of service, but it might actually rise to a, a level of a criminal act or a threat of violence. Uh, uh, to oneself or to others. So there's a, just as part of the regular abuse evaluation on the platform, we will get leads of threats. Uh, you know, there are, there's just a hundred different ways where it could come to us. So across products, there's like that. Then there's external threat reporting. So we might hear from users who flag something for us to say, th this is something that was on a video or on uh, some other uh, content posted on our system that you should look at and that will also get flagged for us. Sometimes people even call us, uh, and there's, we even get sometimes things in the mail, so it comes at us in a hundred different ways. Uh, and the trick there operationally is just to make sure a company can actually get those things routed to a team that knows what to do with it. So I spend a lot of time writing about restrictions on law enforcement sharing of information, um, and so curious as to, um, how, how Google and other companies are able to, to share this kind of information without running into any sort of legal restrictions. Are the legal authorities sufficient and, and how do they operate? In yeah, this, so I'm a lawyer, place? so I'm, that's, I'm very sensitive to that for sure. Uh, and you know, we, 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 companies like Google, Facebook, Twitter, um, you know, lots of other ones that you can all mention, we, it's, it, we, we're kind of in the business of holding other people's information, and there's a, there's a statute that has been around since 1986, been changed a little bit since then, but it, kind of, it governs our behavior around this data. Uh, and although it hasn't been updated in a while in meaningful way, important ways, it actually gives us quite a bit of permission to share information, particularly if it looks like somebody's life's at risk or there's, there's somebody who's gonna be physically injured, that gives the companies, if they have a good faith belief, that disclosing the information is necessary to stop that bad result, we, we have the permission uh, under the statute to disclose that data voluntarily. Uh, there's also an exception to the rules against disclosing data to the government where if it appears uh, that there is a commission of a crime going on, then we have some, some permissions as, the, as well there. Now we're careful about using these, both because there's liability there, but also because we don't want to misuse uh, or, or uh, abuse the trust that users have given us when they've allowed us to have their data. So there's definitely some policies around that, but there's plenty of room there for good information sharing with the government, particularly around threats. So we've been talking about Google's sharing of information with the government. What about the flow of information the other way? How, what kinds of inf threat information are you receiving from the government and how is that process working? Are there areas where we should be thinking about some improvements possibly? You know, the information share, like it's been all day today. We've, I don't know that there's been a panel where that, con that, that topic didn't come up about information sharing. And it, it's, been, it's been that way for as long as I've been doing this work. It's been a long time now about the government wanting companies to share information with them, companies wanting the government to share information back. Uh, and there have been different ways to try it, different uh, organizations set up to, do, to help do this. There have been statutory changes that have been intended to help make that exchange happen. I will say that I, I think, my, in my opinion, the information sharing around threats from the government to companies has greatly improved uh, in the last few years. Uh, I still think it could be better, but it is, it is no longer the um, uncommon event where we get leads from the government that are actually useful leads. Uh, that we can pursue and, and help protect our users and help defend our network. So it's been, it's been pretty good. It's mostly at the federal level. Um, and I, I think there are some things that could be improved there. I, you know, a common gripe from companies, and I, I say gripe, but it is an, an, under, it is an understandable situation. There, there is an awful lot of information that I think could be useful that the government has to, to give to companies, but they, the government is reluctant to do so because an awful lot of stuff is classified. 
Uh, and that's just a tricky situation. It's difficult to declassify stuff, but it's easy to classify it. So you end up with a situation where even when there's some subsection of information, like a subset of data of a larger classified report, it's hard to just get that one piece declassified to be able to share it, maybe with some additional context that would also need to be classified. That is, that is a constant struggle, and it, that has, it has been that way for uh, you know, probably decades, uh, but certainly as long as I've been doing this work, where the classification does tend to get in the way. Now, one of the techniques you can deal with that is companies can hire people who have security clearances. The information can be shared with the company to somebody with a clearance, and it's all the, you know, all this, the same restrictions apply to that data. It's just held by somebody inside the company. The struggle there is, if it's data that needs to be actually implemented into systems to be able to detect bad behavior, for example, uh, it's possible that it could end up being seen by non-cleared folks. So, so there's sometimes a little bit of a trap there where you may have cle cleared personnel in your company to be able to take the data, but then they can't do anything with it because of its cleared nature. So that, that actually isn't the panacea here. It can still help sometimes, but when it comes to real operational leads, the classification of data has ha, continues to be a hindrance. So we've been talking so far about voluntary sharing, both voluntary sharing by, by companies and voluntary sharing by the government. I want to switch a little the topic a little bit to talk about compelled disclosure mm -hmm. challenges. And um, I was part of a report that was released about a year and a half ago called Low Hanging Fruit. Um, it was done in conjunction with, the, with CSIS. And in, in writing that report, we spent, my co-author and I spent a lot of time talking to federal, state, and local law enforcement officials, and also to representatives from providers, including to Rick. Um, and we heard very, very different narratives about some of the struggles. So it was almost like the two communities were talking past each other, where state, local, and federal law enforcement were very concerned about what they perceived to be um, the slowness with which companies responded to requests and what they perceived to be insufficient attention to law enforcement requests. We would then have the same conversation with the providers and we would get a very different perspective in which providers felt as if they were responding quite effectively and quite efficiently and to the extent that there were challenges, the challenge were, challenges were the result of poorly written requests by law enforcement, either requests that were overbroad or that were not authorized by law in other ways, or were asking for data that the company simply didn't have. So very different narratives, and we, we made a number of suggestions directed both at federal, state, and local law enforcement about how to improve some of their systems and policies and approaches, and we also made a number of requests directed at the providers, including suggestions that like making sure that there were clear law enforcement guidance readily available to law enforcement, that there were easy accessible mechanisms to make requests via online portals, um, that there were, staffing was, was sufficient and increased and that there was a commitment to, to rapidly responding to requests. So I just wanna turn it back to Rick now that there's been a year and a half has passed <laughs> and see what, what kinds of developments you've seen from your end? Well, the, I guess the number one development is the requests continue to come in, <laughs> uh, and, it, and uh, we get more and more every year. We just, we, we publish a transparency report. If this is a, a topic that's of interest to you, uh, you know, companies, the providers, and their response to law enforcement requests, most of the big companies now have transparency reports. I will shamelessly say we were the first to do this. Uh, and was very proud to have done so. But you can look at them and see some statistics about the types of requests companies get and uh, the number of, of situations where they actually produce data in response and, th and the number that, where they do not, and then a little bit of context there. So you can, you can get a look at that kind of volume. For, for companies like Google, you know, we're at about, I think, I should look at this report, I should have looked at it before coming up here, but you could, you're all on, online, you can check me on this, but I think it's roughly around 100,000 a year on the criminal side. I think Facebook's higher, Microsoft might be lower, Twitter's somewhere in there, uh, and you can have a look at that. So it's a high volume of demands. Now the vast majority of these, uh, this is on the U.S. side. The vast majority are subpoenas that are issued to us, and with a subpoena under the law I mentioned earlier, the 1986 law, the Stored Communications Act, government can get basic subscriber information so they can identify who's behind that Gmail account, 
uh, the subscriber information we have or who's behind a YouTube account, that kind of thing, similar with Facebook or Twitter handles. Uh, but you can't get much more than that. You can't get content with that. You can't get a lot of detail about who this person emailed or chatted with, that kind of thing. Uh, and that's the vast majority of legal process. That's actually pretty easy. Uh, that's one where law enforcement um, has a, most by the, for the most part, has a simple form that looks the same, really even across state and local, certainly within the federal system. So the, the, the vast majority actually fall in that category. The more difficult types of legal process are the more bespoke ones, the, their court orders or their search warrants where uh, prosecutors and investigators kind of freestyle a little bit. That's, that's certainly within their prerogative. But that's where things get tricky because that's where there's a, with a high volume of these requests, they're all different. You've got to evaluate each one of those things individually. Uh, you want to do the right thing. You want to produce the data that's with, you know, reasonably within the scope, but you got to make sure you're not producing data that's not within the scope. You know, that's the law for, for the companies. There's not a lot of wiggle room there. Uh, so it, it is a, it's actually a very manual process, as it should be, to review these things. Now, what we've tried to do to make it effic more efficient, but not at the cost of losing the quality of the review uh, and making sure we're protecting our users' rights but also honoring the legal process, we've tried to get rid of some of that transactional cost that's, that doesn't actually help the quality. Uh, of the response. So we do have for United States officials and then and little by little we're rolling this outside of the United States, an online submission um, uh, interface so that they can send in their search warrants and their subpoenas through an online system. It doesn't have to get it doesn't have to be faxed. Oh the days that we used to get these things by fax were awful. You come in in the morning and you know um, and lots of manual input. Those days are over. Uh, we now have like a, a real interface for the submission of the legal process. It still goes through all the same manual review, but you got you get rid of all the unnecessary inefficiencies that existed before. Uh, we're we're a big company, so we can afford things like that. We can have I've got teams of attorneys who are available 24 hours a day to deal with these things. We've got scores and scores of of um, legal personnel who do the actual review. Uh, and they also are, are available 24-7, particularly to deal with emergencies, and we get quite a few emergencies where they need the data very quickly. Uh, and so we're, we are well resourced to do that. But it's not cheap, uh, and for new companies that are coming up, um, they, they, you know, they have a surprise for them when they get into this, into this type of business because they will start getting these, these requests. Uh, and it's not, it's not rare. Uh, it will become a very common thing. So we do talk with uh, the smaller companies who are up and coming uh, and try to share best practices with them, learn from them as well, but kind of make sure that there's a, a, a shared knowledge of how to deal with these things so that the data is going out the door as is required by law, but very much consistent with the, uh, the rights of the users as well. Can you talk a little bit about what happens when you deny a disclosure order? So that you view either a subpoena or a court order and, and there's a decision not to, to respond. What's, what's the, what's often, what are the kinds of justifications for not responding and what's the process when that yeah, happens? Yeah, you know, I think this surprises a lot of people. Like, yeah, we get a search warrant, but there might actually be a problem with it and we might have to say no to turning over the data or we get a, uh, this still happens occasionally, we'll get a subpoena and the subpoena is asking for the contents of somebody's Gmail account. Uh, under the law, as we see it anyway, and, and the DOJ uh, seems to be agree in agreement with this, to get the contents of somebody's Gmail account, you can't use a subpoena, you've got to use a, a search warrant with the probable cause standard having been satisfied and the other requirements. So sometimes we'll get a legal process that's just invalid for the type of data that's requested. We still occasionally will get a subpoena that says Facebook Inc. and asking for information. We push back on that. Uh, and, but, but really what's going on there is it's just our evaluation of the legal process to say, well, is this valid? And if it's to Twitter or to Facebook, it is not valid. So we will push back on it. If it's a subpoena for the contents of communication, it's invalid for that. So we will... Uh, we'll deal with that. Now the process is we will communicate with the 
typically the agent, but sometimes the prosecutor who issued the legal process to explain the deficiency in it. Uh, and sometimes it gets corrected and resubmitted to us, and then if the problem has been solved, the, then we'll be able to provide the data that's requested. But there's actually a dialogue there sometimes. One of the most common situations is that the, it'll be a search warrant, as I was mentioning, those can be very bespoke, and it might be really confusing what is asked for in the, in the search warrant. They may use terms that aren't familiar to us. We don't have buddy lists. So when they say turn over your buddy list, it's like, okay, you probably were using an AOL subpoena from uh, 1999 and you just haven't updated it or search warrant. So we will go back and say, well, when you say buddy list, you know, what, what exactly do you mean there? So there'll be a discussion back and forth with the agent or the prosecutor about what the, some of the vagaries. Sometimes the, the interpretation that's given to us by the requesting agent uh, fits the language in the search warrant and then we're like, okay, we know what you mean and everything else is fine, so we'll produce the data. Sometimes the interpretation that's given to the actual words in the legal process doesn't actually fit the words in which case we'll, we'll probably have to deliver the news that what well, we think you need to go back to the judge and make sure you get the right, because we don't think this, this piece of legal process actually covers the data you're now telling me that you're interested in. So there's a bit of back and forth there. At the volume we're talking about, that back and forth is not cheap because really we gotta keep moving quickly or you get behind very fast. Uh, so that's, that's one of the things we would rather not have. We would rather have it everybody understand you know, what data is available, what you really need for your case, and how to ask for it. So we do have, we do engage in outreach with law enforcement to talk about that, about how to improve the legal process and, and how to ask for the kind of data that we can understand, or at least get come to an understanding about what is intended there. So far we've been talking about this in the domestic context with U.S. requests, and it gets more interesting and, and more challenging when we add the international dimension as well. Mm -hmm. So I want to start first with the piece of international law requests that are voluntary in the sense that um, the law that, that Rick has been talking about permits or at least does not prohibit companies from disclosing non-content data to foreign governments. Um, so whereas in the U.S., U.S. law enforcement needs a subpoena generally, foreign law enforcement does not under U.S. law and companies like Google can voluntarily disclose that. Um, whether or not that information gets disclosed then becomes a discretionary choice in the hands of the company, which raises a whole host of complicated decisions um, for the company. So wondering if you could talk a little bit about how that works. Yeah, I can talk a bit about that. There, there are, um, probably in the, sim the most simplistic case under U.S. laws, you outlined it nicely, a U.S. company uh, has restraints on what it can disclose to U.S. government entities that aren't constraints that apply to non-U.S. government entities. It may seem odd, but that's how the statute is structured and one assumes Congress intended it. Uh, and so a lot, what, a, what a companies have generally done, and this includes Google, is to, decide, to make a decision based on uh, human rights principles and rule of law of the com country that's requesting the data, the non-U.S. jurisdiction that's asking for the data. Uh, so the company may have the right under the U.S. law to disclose the data, but in determining whether it really wants to do it, it may look at that jurisdiction and say, can we trust that the rule of law, that the human rights standards are high enough that we ought to be honoring this type of legal process? And you may also look at it and say, well, this looks like it's a U.S. person that is at issue here. Do we want, even where it is a, a country with good rule of law and human rights standards, do we want to be honoring that type of legal process when really they maybe should be coming through what was referred to earlier today, you heard about the mutual legal assistance treaty process or diplomatic process with the U.S. government. So um, co companies may step back a little bit and say, you know, when it comes to these non-U.S. requests, we're going to let government to government diplomatic arrangements step in and decide what data leaves the company and goes to the other jurisdiction. Uh, but there, so that you get a wide range of, of behaviors by companies in the United States and actually outside the United States too under their own laws about which country's legal process will they honor. And so is this a, do you, are you making country by country determinations or request by request determinations? It's, it's a little of each. So it may be that 
uh, the, there's going to be, I'm not gonna name names of countries, but there may be some country where you're like, I don't care what the demand is, I'm not going to be honoring that country's request because we cannot trust that jurisdiction. In other situations it may be, but, but even if the answer is yes, we will honor the, the law of that jurisdiction or the request from that jurisdiction, there's gonna be a secondary review of the legal process. Uh, and if there's indications that honoring that legal process would violate some company principle, you may have a principle that says, you know, we value free expression. And this demand, even though it's coming from a country that we trust, looks like it's actually being gonna be used in a case to suppress political free speech, for example. And that may be a situation where uh, the company would decide not to produce the data, whereas if it looked like it was just a fraud case, they would be fine with, with turning over the information. But it's a, it's a, this is a tricky area for companies because they're, they're putting themselves in a uh, situation where they're trying to really judge uh, the quality of a country's internal systems in a way that's really probably better to be done by government to government but we just don't have good government to govern diplomatic arrangements right now that can handle the scale of these requests. So companies are kind of put in this jam to fill the gap. Yes, yeah, so it's interesting. This, this coming week, uh, or at the end of this, this Wednesday, beginning this Wednesday, there's a meeting of the Council of Europe's um, Cybercrime Committee um, and the, what's, what's often known as the Budapest Convention. And one of the things on the agenda is a draft um, proposal that would facilitate government um, to provide a request precisely for subscriber, subscriber information only. So right. we're talking about things like IP address. Um, so wondering if, if you've been following that and if you think that would be a, a it also includes certain um, criteria that have to be included in all of those requests mm -hmm. as well in order for them to be legitimate. And another piece of it is it would include some mechanism for companies explicitly to raise objections with their host country and, and allow for the kind of government to government negotiation that, that you were just talking about. So yeah. curious as to what your thoughts are. No, about I think this. it's a good step. Uh, the, the Budapest Convention, uh, like, I think pe sometimes people's eyes glaze over when they hear phrases like that, but it's actually a, a, a significant um, mechanism. And uh, I, think, uh, there, it's a, I think countries should be con seriously considering adopting Budapest Convention in the second additional protocol. Uh, I think it'll ease the um, the flow of information that's needed for cybersecurity protection purposes, among other things, but, but also guarantee the kind of due process and, and rule of law protections that we really would like to see around the world. I, I think it actually you know, raises the, the level of the water, all the boats go up as a result of, of adoption of these, of these principles, uh, you know, presuming that they're actually honored, uh, but it's a first step towards, I think, solving one of the thorniest problems, which is the jurisdictional, one of the jurisdictional questions we were talking about earlier today, how countries help each other and share information. And the, and the proposal is it's limited just to subscriber information, right. so it doesn't address the other um, key challenge, which is posed by U.S. Legal, the legal regime that we've been talking about, the 1986 statute, which prohibits companies from disclosing content data to foreign governments. And this is, for probably as many of you know, been a long-standing source of frustration for foreign governments and led to the passage about a year and a half ago of what's known colloquially as the Cloud Act, which permits certain um, executive agreements that facilitate foreign governments making direct requests to companies like Google and others for content of communications. Um, we've seen one such draft agreement been, has been negotiated, um, the US-UK agreement, and then once it's sent over to Congress, there's another 180-day waiting period before it goes into effect. Um, but again, curious as to your perspective as to, as to whether these kinds of agreements will help, whether it's a step in the right direction and, and what else is needed. You know, the, the Cloud Act um, is intended to sit side by side with the Mutual Legal Assistance Treaty process, which is really the kind of the, the gold standard for all of this stuff, but, but it's a heavyweight process. And the Cloud Act was meant to be something of an alternative to mutual legal assistance. 
uh, but only for jurisdictions that have agreed to uh, satisfy the standards that are set out in the statute. And if you're curious, you really, it's a, it's a good read. Go take a look at the statute and, and see what the standards are. Uh, and, uh, and then there is an executive agreement between the countries that can further uh, govern what are the situations that data can be shared. Uh, so I think, I think there is a lot of hope that can come from, from this arrangement uh, that it doesn't, it doesn't increase the authority of anybody to do anything, uh, but what it does say is that companies are permitted in certain situations where there's a Cloud Act arrangement in place to disclose content voluntarily. So it's actually at its heart uh, the lowering of what is called a blocking statute in the United States preventing uh, companies from disclosing content except in these uh, particular situations. All right, so I have a million more questions, but we are unfortunately out of time, so please join me in thanking Rick. Thank you, Jim.